I haven't played through one of these ever. Really? These amps, yeah. That's good. Sounds okay. How's it going? Good to see you, Jeff. Good to see you. Last time was in the fog of Cabo San Lucas. Cabo San Lucas, Sammy's birthday party. It happens yeah. every year on the 13th of October. I don't know about you, but I barely remember those. Those are some <laughs> of the best times I've ever had in my entire life. Yeah. And it's just a big uh, drunken jam session, I think. That's what it is, yeah. I do remember the first time I went down there, I got to the club and I'm thinking, this is going to be a lot of fun, you know? It's a small stage, as you know, especially for, for drummers. Sure. You're, you're sort of packed in there in the oh, back. Yeah. But there's one thing that a lot of guests apparently do, and I, I fell right in, in line with everybody else, is I went running on the stage during the soundtrack. I was excited to see Mike. I hadn't seen him in a while. Right. And the first thing I do is I hit my head that speaker. on the speaker, because <laughs> yep. there's that low-hanging monitor, yep. right? And of course, I hit it so hard, I didn't know what had happened. I just remember I was on the ground and I thought, what just happened? You know, I was over there and now I'm on the ground. What happened, you know? Yep. And that sort of set the tone for the rest of the weekend, you know? <laughs> Knocked you in the head and you got to get up and get going, right? <laughs> That's right. I'll tell you another jam I remember now that we were talking about it. In uh, 1990, we were playing uh, with Pants Air, obviously. Uh, a small club in Toronto called Rock and Roll Heaven, mm -hmm. and there was about 140 people there. It was probably 12 degrees outside, mm -hmm. or colder than that probably, and Rob Halford comes in oh, wow. and sees the band, and we knew just about every free song in the book, you know, so uh, he got up and did a couple of songs with us, and I remember I'd, I'd never felt that high in my life. I mean, mm -hmm. it was just the ultimate high to have the metal god, Rob Halford, get up and sing a couple tunes with you. and. Yeah. Two days later, we get a call from our management that says Judas Priest wants to take you on tour for yeah. the entire Painkiller tour in Europe. So that was our first tour and our first opportunity. So, you know, sometimes opportunities come from these jams. Sometimes bands come from these jams. Yes, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, they do say, you know, what is it, 90% is just showing up in the business. Yeah. I think it's 90. Is it 50? 95? <laughs> well, there are people like No Show Jones that never showed up. That's so. right, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, that, I often... Uh, tell my friends that it's like you do. They they say, hey, why are you doing that thing? You know, and and it's like, well, you just got to show up because you never know what's going to happen. You're absolutely right. A, a crazy jam and a funky little club on a freezing night, and all of a sudden, a great opportunity opens up. Yep. Is that too loud? <laughs> so a lot of people don't know this, but I started out as a drummer. Okay. I started out sucking in continued that trend, you know, which is why I gave it up. But I took lessons uh, from a guy named Mr. Patrikas, a jazz drummer, came okay. to the house. Yeah. I stuck with it for a couple of years. I was nine years old. Eventually gave it up, turned the guitar because of Hendrix. I was a total Hendrix freak by then. So at 14 when he dies, I decide I'm going to be a guitar player. And I wind up in a band immediately, and we're just playing Black Sabbath and uh, Uriah Heep and uh, Zeppelin, of course, and Stones, and just about everybody else. So uh, my influences started out really with those third generation electric blues players that really created what we call metal. Right. Uh, it's really interesting. We probably share the same kind of influences, I'm guessing. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, when did you start? Well, I started a little later than you. I started when I was 14, and uh, before that I was really into sports, baseball, soccer, that kind of stuff, uh -huh. even football quite a bit. 
And uh, my dad was a country musician, and uh, he wanted me to sign up for band when I went to seventh grade. So went in, and as they walked around the room, they handed each people uh, different instruments. And I was one of the last guys, and they came over and handed me this huge thing called the tuba. <laughs> and I was like, hell yeah, I'm going to be the tuba player for the band. you know. So I took this thing home at lunchtime, and I was blowing on it in the living room. And I remember my dad getting up out of bed, and he had played a gig that night, didn't get home till 3 in the morning, and usually didn't like to be disturbed. you know. And he comes running around the corner in his tidy whities and he's like, son, son, what are you doing? I said, dude, I'm going to be the tuba player for the band. He goes, what? So I'm going to be the tuba player, man. And he goes, no, you're not. <laughs> he goes, you will never, ever make a penny playing that instrument uh -huh. in your entire life. I'm putting my clothes on. We're taking you back up there, and I'm putting you on the drums. Needless to say, I was heartbroken at the time. <laughs> I mean, I remember crying. I was like, no, they want me to be the tuba player. And he took me up there, and he kind of had it out with the band director and put me on the drums. And uh, the next day, uh, I had a practice pad and a pair of sticks and made it to first chair and never gave it away the rest of the, rest of the time I was in school band. And anyways, uh, the world kind of has uh, my dad to thank for changing heavy metal drumming history, so to speak. Yeah. And then, you know, I discovered this little band called Kiss. And uh, it was on from there, man. I knew that was the kind of music I wanted to play. You know, I was heavily influenced by, you know, a lot of the British metal, you know, Judas Priest, Black yeah. Sabbath, Iron Maiden. And then all of a sudden, this band called Van Halen comes along and really changed my life. Yeah, you know, so yeah. and me and my brother, you know, we were the biggest Van Halen fans. And he started off on the drums too, like you did. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. And it's the old Eddie and Alex Van Halen story. I got better than him and wouldn't let him play on the drums anymore. <laughs> so I went to my dad and said, "What do I do?" And he said, "Let me get you a guitar." You know. And I used to walk by his room all the time, and I would see him in there with Kiss makeup on, holding this thing, making all the faces in front of the mirror. <laughs> and I'm like, "Dude, are you ever going to learn how to play that thing, man?" And it kind of got frustrating, you know. I'd go in my room, put my 45s on, play along with them. And uh, about three weeks, maybe a month later, he comes in and he goes, hey, man, you want to jam? And he had this little pig nose amp and his honer, uh, Les Paul knockoff that my dad got him to start with. Mm -hmm. And he sits down and he goes, da 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 And we played that riff for probably 10 hours, just nonstop. Not, not the rest of the song, just that one riff. And I knew from that point on we were going to play music together, and that's that's where my life was headed. Wow. So no heavy metal tuba? No heavy metal tuba. <laughs> I probably would have been a hell of a bass player, but I'm glad I, I'm glad I ended up I, on the drums. I think the world of metal is, <laughs> is missing either your input, tuba. There's, there's an, you know, an idea for an album there. <laughs> drums here. <laughs> Don't need them. <laughs> so Joe, tell me a little bit about your writing skills, uh, you know, the things that influence you and the things that really make you want to just throw down. Oh man, I am influenced by everything I heard growing up. My parents were of the jazz age, so they played jazz music all the time. Uh, my mother played a lot of classical music, thinking it would raise our uh, intellect level perhaps maybe, or just expose us to a wider range of music than what they would listen to when they were having parties and things like that. I was uh, youngest of five kids, so um, I sort of heard my older sisters, my older brother, live through early rock and roll, British invasion, Motown, uh, what eventually became rock and classic rock and all that kind of stuff. And as they left the house, they left all their 45s and LPs behind. And so I inherited this really strange collection of music that spanned all of that. So sometimes when I write, I'm looking to do something really weird. You know, like, um, I remember writing this one. It's just an odd uh, set of chords where each chord puts you in a different mode. And it was something that was inspired by something I learned in, in high school. A uh, music theory teacher was teaching me about uh, ideas of composition from uh, 1900 the pitch axis theory where you would keep uh, what the audience hears is their main note, their key note the same, but the keys would change around it. And so I started to come up with uh, a love for cluster chords where notes are close together. And having a song like this would put me in 
this is very technical for a drummer, but E Lydian, E minor, E Lydian, E Mixolydian. And these things would fascinate me just from a musical point because I'd start to play them and I would feel like, oh, I feel like I'm at home now. Right. That's what my body is resonating to, even before my head would realize that I was sort of riffing off of something that I've picked up in, in a high school music theory class. But eventually, all that stuff would, would be put together with this, uh, which I just love the, the simple Chuck Berry R&B, I love all that stuff. Again, hits me on a visceral level first, and then I can, that part of my brain that's been trained to be a musician kicks in and I can see the beauty of it uh, from sort of the, the, the architecture of the music, you know what I mean? Right. Sometimes I get to put them all together. Uh, I had a song, I'm not sure I can play it, I gotta make a switch here. So that's like a, I, yeah, that's, and all that. Yeah, all that silly stuff in there. I was thinking about the early days of hearing my parents' jazz records, and I'm thinking about Gene Krupa doing the ch 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 right. and I'm just playing along, and I'm using the guitar to imitate a horn section. But of course, then I, that song, I tie it up with a, with a boogie, and then there's that middle section that goes uh, back to that pitch axis thing. And I'm doing uh, hammer-ons very much, much like Eddie. I'm a, I'm a big Eddie fan as well. And at the time I wrote that, I thought, what has Eddie not done with it? He went in this direction with it and created this beautiful sound. What can I do with it that won't be copying him, but it'll be elevating the idea of using your two hands on the fretboard? So I pulled in that pitch axis compositional theory into that, and I created something where I go through all these different modes just using one string, wow. uh, but using that technique. Stuck that all in that one song called Satch Boogie, and it almost sort of defines a lot about my style when I was a kid as I started playing and then growing up becoming more musically aware. Right on, man. Yeah, yeah. How about yourself? How do you like to write? Ah, man, uh, you know, I'm heavily influenced by the guitar. You know, the guitar and the drums really do complement each other. And there's a lot of that cha 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 that yeah. goes on together that really needs to be part of it, you know? And then there's times when you come up with drum things and you can only envision what it's gonna sound like when there's the guitar there. Or maybe you're just coming up uh, with a drum thing to put in a drum solo or something, you know? And uh, I remember uh, when we finished the first Pantera record, uh, Cowboys From Hell, uh, I was taking the, the drums down and I took the snare away. And I came up with this groove that ended up being a song called Primal Concrete Sledge. And when I was out there playing it, we had really come to our deadline. We had to finish the record. And my brother heard it from the other room and he comes running in and he goes, don't touch a thing, man. We got to build a song around that right wow. now. And, uh, you know, I started into the drum groove and he started in with the ch -ch 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 thing with it. And about that time, our producer, Terry Day, comes running around the corner and he goes, man, what are you guys doing? We're done. We got to get this to New York next week. We got to finish mixing. You know, we're, we're out of time. And we're like, just look, dude, we're on to something. We got to do this, man. So that's the reason why it ended up only being two minutes and 38 seconds right? long. Yeah, <laughs> we added a little halftime section in the middle. But it ended up being the best addition to that record, and it really was kind of a sign that led us into the direction on Vulgar on the next record, you know. Yeah. So uh, that kind of they kind of just worked together like that. Uh, same thing happened with uh, Becoming on Far Beyond Driven. I was out doing that roll thing on the right foot, uh, thing, and Dime heard it from the other room and comes comes in and goes, "Dude, we got to build a song around that right now," you know. So sometimes they can't start with the drums, you know. But generally, I feel the energy from the guitar, and then. When I'm writing to, uh, I really want to envision what's going to happen to the audience, especially a metal audience. You know, they do it, the pits and the moshing and all that crazy stuff, and you really want to be able to create those parts that make them want to move. You know, not only just like just a headbang or whatever, but just to get out. You know, and so that's really important when I'm writing and when we're writing as a band to really envision what that's going to do to the audience. They call it a reunion for a reason. It's bringing back the original members. When I walk out on stage, I get into a zone. I forget about all the gear because it's been designed to make me work. Yeah, baby. <laughs>